This video is different from the thousands of YouTube videos about AI because AI is obviously not like your brain. The training process and the functional results are different. Keep watching as I introduce the most likely alternative to today's AI to enable human-like understanding and common sense. I'm Charles Simon, longtime AI researcher, software developer, and manager. In addition to AI work, I've developed software for several neurological test instruments and neural simulators and along the way learned a lot about the capabilities and limitations of biological neurons and how your brain must work to do the things it does. In previous videos, I've detailed numerous ways machine learning is not like your brain, and if you want the details, I suggest you watch this video. Today, I'm going to describe a form of neurosymbolic AI, which offers huge benefits and overcomes many of the shortcomings of today's AI. This open source software is available on GitHub. Neurosymbolic AI is loosely defined as some combination of neural networks and symbolic AI, but I'm working towards a neurologically plausible system which can learn, represent information, and perform logic in the way that the human mind can. To illustrate why we're taking a different approach, let's start with the classic example of a neural network which has been trained to recognize images of dogs and cats. Two common situations such a network struggles with what happens if the system receives unexpected input? The image of a horse, for example. And second, how can the system explain why it makes the decisions it does? Our neurosymbolic approach addresses these issues. The key distinction of neurosymbolic AI is to recognize that specific neurons have specific meanings and that the circles and lines of our neural network animations represent clusters of neurons, not individual cells. This allows us to add a few capabilities in a biologically plausible way. For the remainder of this video, I'll refer to these neuron clusters as things, because that's what they usually represent, and I'll call the connections between them relationships. This means that some things represent these attributes, and any physical object can be represented as the combination of attribute things which have relationships to it. The relationships relate things to each other, so we can represent, for example, dogs have tails, dogs are animals, and Fido is a dog. Each relationship has a confidence value or weight, just as in the neural network. And any set of attributes can be used to search for things, again, in a manner very similar to a feed-forward neural network. The system creates new things and relationships whenever they are needed. This upends the idea of AI having a training phase and a deployment phase because the system can learn new information and acquire new skills at any time. Let's presume that our system has learned to recognize only dogs and cats. When it sees a horse, what happens? Either the set of attributes it sees results in a low confidence so there is no result, or it gets a high enough confidence result and is told it is wrong. In either case, the system needs to learn, so it allocates a new thing and adds relationships to the current attributes. This new thing is an unknown object. We know it represents a horse, but the system does not. The system only knows that there is a thing with some set of attribute relationships, but little else. Subsequently, the system could be told, this is a horse, 
which would create relationships between the new unknown thing and things representing the word horse. You can see that this change, the ability to add things and relationships as needed, revolutionizes the way we construct a neural network because we don't have to define in advance how many results we're going to recognize, how many layers we'll need, or any of the network parameters. There aren't network layers as such because these are formed by the relationship structure which can change as the system's knowledge evolves. When a new horse thing is created, it gets relationships to the attributes being sensed at the time. That is, if the first horse encountered is brown and has pointy ears, the system will reasonably assume that all horses are brown and have pointy ears. When the system subsequently encounters a black horse with pointy ears, the confidence of the horse's brown relationship will be reduced, while the confidence of the horse has pointy ears relationship will be increased. This way, the system continuously adapts and corrects for conflicting information. Let me underscore that unlike a knowledge graph, the horse thing that was just created contains no information at all about horses. All the information is represented by the relationships to other things, such as the attributes, actions, or anything else the mind could conceive. This is how your mind must work because biological neurons obviously don't have labels or contain sophisticated information. Only those things which are used to connect to the outside world, such as words, give the system its meaning. When the system is told Fido is a dog, it creates a new node representing Fido and adds the is a relationship to the dog node. This allows Fido to inherit all the attributes of being a dog. Your mind does this too. You already formed a mental image of Fido based only on the statement Fido is a dog. If you subsequently see a picture of Fido, your mind can add relationships specific to Fido. If the system has the relationship dogs are animals, Fido will also inherit all the attributes of being an animal. So the inheritance process works to any number of levels of is a relationships. The hierarchy of information and inheritance of attributes is a huge mechanism for data compression. If you know about a hundred dogs, you don't need a relationship to connect the has a tail attribute to any of them you only need one has a tail relationship to the dog thing. Then this attribute will be inherited by all things which are understood to be dogs. In this example, we've reduced the number of relationships by a factor of a hundred. Our system has an agent which does just this, a process I call attribute bubbling. But some dogs don't have tails. How can we represent that? Simple. Just add a has no tail relationship to the dog things without tails. When the hierarchy is traversed, conflicting relationships will override their inherited counterparts. This applies at all levels, so you can have a general rule, exceptions, and exceptions to the exceptions. As an alternative, there could be a subclass of dogs which have no tails, and Stubby and Bob could be made members of that subclass. We have an agent that automatically does this too, depending on the number of things which share the exception. Let's give our neurosymbolic AI one more capability which humans obviously possess, but which is absent in neural networks. The neural network is intended to perform feed-forward searches so it can select the best result given a set of attributes like this. With a reverse search, one could ask, what are the attributes of a dog? 
and the system could traverse the relationships in reverse to identify its answer. I could also ask the system to name some dogs, and the system will follow the is a relationships in reverse. With this reverse traversal, we have implemented an explainable AI. The system is always able to trace back the relationships which led to a result. These are the reasons for its decision. So let's summarize. We've replaced the structured neural network with an unstructured graph of things connected by relationships. Relationships still have weights, just like the connections in the neural network, and feed-forward searching remains similar. But we've added the ability to create new things and relationships as needed to enable one-shot learning and the ability to adapt relationship confidences to replace the backpropagation algorithm. Lastly, we've added attribute inheritance with exceptions and bidirectional relationships, obvious capabilities in your mind which are absent in neural networks. I've just scratched the surface in this video. This neurosymbolic approach outlines a system which works the same way the human mind does. In subsequent videos, I'll introduce more capabilities and the benefits such a system brings. Most of these capabilities are already implemented in our project, The Brain Simulator 3. You can download the project from GitHub at the link in the description. You can also join the Future AI Society to learn more and participate in our monthly online meetings and enhance the development of this software which forms the basis for the future of artificial intelligence. If you found this information interesting, be sure to like and subscribe so the YouTube algorithm will encourage others to learn about it too. And as always, thanks for watching.